Good afternoon and welcome to this pre-application webinar for the Building Partnerships and Broadening Perspectives to Advance LC Research Program, which I will refer to as BEAR. My name is Renee Sterling. I'm one of four program directors with NHGRI's LC Research Program, and I will lead today's webinar on behalf of the LC team. Today's webinar is being recorded. The slides are available for download on the webinar event page. The recording, responses to questions, and a resource list will be posted to the event page within a week or so. In the Zoom, the chat feature has been disabled for participants, but we will use it to post helpful links and other information throughout the webinar. All links that are shared in the chat will be included in the final resource list. You should feel free to ask questions or share comments using the Q&A tool at any time. We may respond to quick questions in the Q&A and address remaining questions after the formal presentation. If we don't have time to answer all questions live, we'll be sure a response is included in the final Q&A list. In the Q&A tool, you can upvote a question if you see something that you're particularly interested in. Uh, and we will go through those again after the formal presentation. Today, I'm going to review key aspects of the Notice of Funding Opportunity, or NOFO, for the BEAR program. I will not review everything that appears in the NOFO. Before you get started on an application, you should be sure to read the entire NOFO and feel free to contact us with any questions you may have about requirements, expectations, or other details. In Section 7 of the NOFO, you will find contact information for NHGRI staff you can reach out to with questions about program requirements, financial or grants management, and peer review, as shown on the slide. In addition to uh, Ms. Devin brumbray Coral and Sarah Whelan, we also have joining us our Chief Management Officer, Ms. Deanna Ingersoll. Uh, and so um, these folks, along with other staff from the LC Research Program, uh, are providing support for today's webinar. The webinar is divided into six sections. Following some background, the bulk of my presentation will cover the goal, eligibility criteria, and five required elements of BEAR. I'll point out a few differences between grants and cooperative agreements. Award and budget information will be followed by a brief overview of the peer review process. And after making note of a few key resources, we'll move into Q&A. So starting off with some background. The term LC is often used in different ways. The acronym stands for ethical, legal, and social implications. Very broadly, LC can be thought of as a lens, a framework, or a perspective that's used to assess, examine, or evaluate the field of genetics and genomics. LC also refers to the research program established at NIH in 1990 as part of the Human Genome Project. Key tenants from the development of the LC research program remain essential today. First, to anticipate the implications of advances in the field, Second, to develop and assess policy or societal options for addressing those implications. And third, to evaluate the impact or effect of options chosen. ELSI remains a critical area of research given the increasingly complex and interrelated issues raised by advances in genetics and genomics. And with continued growth and change, the conduct of LC research can benefit from meaningful involvement, engagement within communities, uh, the involvement of new players, whether they be research organizations, scholars, community-based organizations, or other partners, and the infusion of new expertise, perspectives, and approaches into LC research. So moving into our goal, the goal of the BEAR program is to advance LC research by broadening the types of knowledge, skills, experience, expertise, and perspectives that are brought to BEAR in LC-related work. 
This goal ties to the eligibility criteria for the BEAR program. Eligible applicants include domestic organizations receiving less than 30 million in total NIH funding per year for the past three fiscal years. In review of our portfolio of awarded grants, we found that these organizations have not been major recipients of NIH funding for LC research, yet these organizations are viable sources of new ideas, approaches, and community connections. Please note that the eligibility criteria here apply to the applicant organization. Applicants may choose partners who do not meet these criteria and may include foreign components those being organizations or investigators outside the United States. There is an NIH tool you can use to check the amount of funds an organization has received from NIH, if any. And you'll find a link to that tool in the NOFO and we're also posting it uh, to the chat. I'll now go over each of the five required elements of the BEAR program, which are listed in the NOFO as elements A through E. For element A, BEAR applicants should have an overall vision and specific goals for their participation in the BEAR program. And given com the complexity of the program, strategic management will be important to ensure successful implementation of proposed activities and effective coordination across all the people involved in the project. Applicants should have a strategic management plan that addresses leadership and oversight communication, collaboration, and decision-making, which is especially important when there are conflicting views or different opinions on an issue. Strategic management also should address monitoring, planning, and evaluation for the project. As part of element A, applicants should also have a sustainability plan to help ensure LC research continues to move forward within the applicant organization following completion of the program. Under element B, BEAR will support transdisciplinary LC research. And by that we mean research that integrates knowledge and approaches from different disciplines, leading to the potential to develop new frameworks, new hypotheses, theories, or methods that go beyond any one discipline. Transdisciplinary LC research projects should also be timely in their topic, addressing LC issues that are anticipated or interrogated in the field at the time of application. Proposed projects should be complex in that they require collaboration across multiple disciplines. And projects should address issues that are understudied or would fill gaps in knowledge. Applicants can select one or more of four areas under which they would like to conduct LC research projects. The four areas appear here and are further described in the NOFO. These areas consider contextual factors regarding the use of genomics in health, issues of equity and justice, relationships between genomics and identity, and genomics across a broad landscape that goes beyond health. With the selected research area or areas, proposed projects within that area can vary in duration and topic over the course of the awarded project period. As suggested previously, to achieve transdisciplinary research, proposed projects should involve two or more academic disciplines or fields of knowledge, and require multiple research approaches to fully address the research question of interest. A broad range of research approaches and methods can be proposed, and applicants are encouraged but not required to identify a unifying theme for their research. This theme can help define a research agenda for the long term, um, and can work to inform work across other elements that are being conducted at a bare site. The NOFO also addresses the use of population descriptors in research. To enhance the rigor and replication of proposed research, 
applicants are asked to be transparent about the use of population descriptors in their proposed projects. For purposes of the NOFO, population descriptors are defined as variables used to describe or distinguish people from each other based on perceived or actual differences. Of particular interest here are population descriptors related to race, ethnicity, and ancestry, and also sex, gender, and sexuality. Overall, the research questions and phenomena of interest should guide whether and which population descriptors are used in any given study. If applicants propose to use population descriptors in the analysis of data, then those descriptors should be named and defined and a rationale should be provided for their use. Applicants should also describe how variables relate to the proposed research question and be sure to describe any assumptions or limitations tied to the descriptors used in analyses. For element C, Bear sites will establish research teams that include representatives from relevant communities, and sites will also use a team-based approach. Relevant communities are defined in the NOFO as a group or groups of people who are affiliated by geographic proximity, special interest, or similar situation, and who are affected by or have an interest in the research topics under study. Just to reiterate here, community representatives are to serve as active members of research teams, not as research participants or human subjects in proposed projects. Regarding a team-based approach, the NOFO identifies several features applicants should consider. These features are intended to facilitate substantive and ongoing involvement of community members and other members of the research team. Team-based approaches should respect and value the different types of knowledge brought to the table by team members. They should facilitate bi-directional learning across researchers and community representatives. They should equip and empower community representatives for success on the research team and should identify and implement opportunities for benefit sharing. Element D focuses on research capacity building. And the intent of this element is to ensure that funded sites develop the capacity needed to establish, enhance, and sustain LC research within the applicant organization during and after the BEAR program. As part of capacity building, applicants should think about ways to increase the applicant organization's success in receiving future funding for LC research. Capacity building will be informed by a structured needs assessment that would assess the resources, strengths, and opportunities uh, at the applicant organization. Needs assessments should identify gaps in capacity and findings can be used to inform benchmarks for implementing capacity building activities during the program. So applicants must include a needs assessment plan and a description of the current research environment and infrastructure within the applicant organization in their applications. Applications must also describe the overall approach for capacity building, but a specific plan is not required with the application. Successful applicants who receive an award under this program will implement the needs assessment plan proposed in their application during the first 12 months of the project. Findings from that needs assessment would be submitted to NHGRI for review and then awarded applicants would develop their capacity building plans based on those findings. Capacity building plans are to be submitted to NHGRI within 18 months of award and implemented during the remainder of the project period. So to reiterate, the application includes a needs assessment plan and a description of the proposed approach for capacity building. The rest of the work happens post-award. 
but when preparing the application, applicants should be sure to address these requirements in their proposed timelines and in their proposed budgets. So for the final element, E, Bayer will support workforce development with an eye to broadening who is involved in LC research and strengthening their contributions. Workforce development can include various activities that increase, ex that increase exposure to and provide practical experience with LC research. At each site, workforce development efforts must include early career scholars. Early career scholars include undergraduates, post baccalaureates, pre-docs, post-docs, and new or junior faculty. Workforce development efforts may also include community members on research teams, other members of the research team, or other project staff. So that covers the five required elements of BEAR. For those of you who may not have worked on a cooperative agreement award, let me briefly describe the mechanism. So the BEAR program utilizes the UM1 activity code, which is a cooperative agreement for research projects with a complex structure. Under a cooperative agreement award, NIH expects to have substantial involvement in the proposed project. And the focus of this involvement is to support or stimulate activities and work jointly with recipients as partners. The goal is not to direct the project or to assume primary responsibility for the project. In section six of the NOFL, you'll find specific roles and responsibilities for investigators and for NHGRI staff, which would come into play post award. So a few details regarding awards and the budget. NHGRI intends to commit up to 4.8 million in FY 2025 to fund up to four awards. Application budgets are limited to 650,000 in direct costs per year for a maximum of five years. If you propose collaborators or partners any sub-awards are limited to 40% of total direct costs. And while up to 650,000 can be requested in direct costs, the budget you submit needs to reflect the actual needs of the proposed project. With your application, a single budget is required with a budget justification that is delineated by element you'll need to show in the budget justification how proposed costs support each element and the proposed activities therein. The budget should include your best estimate of funds that are necessary and that are reasonable to support all aspects and phases of the project. The NOFO also identifies a minimum level of effort that applicants should propose for principal investigators or program directors, and then also for element leaders. So the PI on the application should have at least 2.4 calendar months devoted to the project. If there's more than one PI, then at least one PI must have at least 1.2 calendar months devoted to the project. Applicants are asked to identify leaders for each of the five elements. The level of effort for element leadership must be at least two calendar months per element. If multiple leaders are proposed for an element, then at least one of those element leaders must have at least one calendar month level of effort. So the level of effort outlined in the NOFO identifies a minimum level of effort to ensure effective management, but applicants should propose levels of effort that are appropriate for the scope and scale of the project they're proposing. Peer review. Per the dates provided in part one of the NOFO, applications are due November 15th, 
and will undergo peer review for scientific merit around March, 2025. NHGRI will convene an expert panel specifically for review of BEAR applications. In section five of the NOFO, you'll find the review criteria that will be used to evaluate your application, including both standard criteria and criteria that are specific to the BEAR program. Applicants should be sure to read both the standard and specific review criteria and provide enough detail across the application to allow reviewers to assess each and every criterion listed. Scores will be released soon after the review and a written summary statement of the review will be provided no later than 30 days uh, after the meeting. And I'll be available to discuss summary statements with applicants after they go up, after they go out, if that's of interest um, post review. So our final section of today's webinar uh, is resources and Q and A. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the most important resources available to you in this application process is the NOFO itself. And reading the entire NOFO is very important. You should not rely on this webinar alone to complete and submit an application. In the NOFO, you'll find a link to the diagram shown here. Uh, it appears in section one, offering a summary of the notice. You might want to print this out as a reference or share it with your grants team or sponsored research office, whoever's helping to support the submission of your application. Today's presentation has focused on sections one through four. In section, I'm sorry, focused on sections one through three. In section four, you'll find an outline of how to prepare each part of your application. And just a few things to highlight here. Letters of intent to apply are encouraged, but not required, and they are not binding. We would like letters of intent by, six, by September 16th, if you plan to submit, they're very helpful for our internal planning. Resource sharing plans and data management and sharing plans are both required by the NOFO. The LC team held a webinar on data management and sharing plans last year, We'll put a link in the chat to those materials. Uh, feel free to contact me if you have questions about preparing either of these plans. You'll also find in section four details on what to include in your research plan and page limits for each element. Page limits are maximum number of pages. And of note, your specific aims page is going to be a summary of the entire project, not just the research projects that you propose under element B. The aims page should be a high level summary of your plans for a bare site and touch upon each element. You're welcome and encouraged to share a draft aims page with me for comment. I can review an aims page and provide you with comments from the LC research team before you submit your application. Please be sure that your AIMS page does not exceed the one page limit. For element A, note that organizational charts are requested. These charts are included in the application under other attachments. Both charts should be compiled into a single file for uploading. Now the first chart is a leadership chart that depicts from where the bear site will be managed within the applicant organization and who will be the leaders for each element, whether they're inside or outside the applicant organization. So who the leaders are and where they sit is the first chart. The second chart shows the positions, roles and relationships among all those involved in the bear site. The chart should include all the people and partners involved and show how they relate to each other. Finally, listed here are some resources you may find useful. In the first column are helpful resources for those who may be less familiar with NIH grants 
and the NIH application process. There are a lot of steps and details in the application process, and it's helpful to review resources like these very early on. You'll want to be sure to submit an application that's easy for reviewers to follow and assess. You also want an application that can be correctly submitted through the required systems. If you have never applied for an NIH grant or you have never served as key personnel on an NIH grant, then please keep in mind, applicant organizations must be registered in multiple systems to submit a grant. And each PI and key personnel must complete registrations as well. And overall, you should allow about six weeks for this process to complete all required registrations. In the second column of the slide, we provide two helpful resources in the area of grantsmanship. The first is an NIH webinar on grant writing for success. The second is a recent webinar with presentations about writing specific aims and how specific aims pages are used. Overall, starting early is key for timely submission of a complete and well-prepared application. So we're ready for your questions. Uh, Nicole Lockhart from the LC Research Team is going to help facilitate the Q&A session. Uh, please note that some questions may have already been answered in the Q&A, so you can check there for a response. You can also upvote a question if you see something that you're particularly interested in. And in any questions we don't get to today, we will provide answers in a Q&A list that will be posted on the, the webinar event page. So Nicole, are we, uh, do we have a first question queued up? Well, we do, Renee. Um, we have one that's already been answered, and then another one I will answer in a moment. <laughs> it's about to hit sun. But there were two that I thought are a little bit more detailed. We're having you talk through them would be really helpful. Uh, the first is from Ali. For the research projects proposed in the application, would it be preferred to have one project with multiple aims or multiple smaller projects under a theme or umbrella? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the NOFO does not have requirements in that regard. And I think that applicants are free to think about the long-term research agenda they'd like to establish for their organization and whether a series of varied projects or one long complex project might best advance their goals for building an LC research program within the organization. So it's really up to the applicant. Um, some topics might lend themselves to, you know, smaller projects that explore lots of angles. Uh, other topics that may be more important or more beneficial for a really deep dive. I think what's critical is that whatever projects you're proposing across element B, that you have multiple disciplines involved, there are varied methods involved, and it's a timely, complex, understudied issue that you're exploring. Would you add to that, Nicole, or is no, that um, I think that's, that's perfect. And I'm sure that's also something uh, Renee could talk through with you on that pre-application call she mentioned. Uh, it's a little easier to think about once you have a specific project in mind, um, and we're able to hear what you're thinking. Yes, please do reach out early. Um, you know, no matter how well formed your idea is, uh, I'm available to to talk and sort of give you some initial feedback on uh, a draft proposed uh, aims. Great. Another question from Megan. Can you say more about what the needs assessment plan should focus on? Yes, um, great question. I think the needs assessment plan is really an opportunity for applicants to think about um, what opportunities are present for their growth and development and what needs they have to um, become competitive for future funding uh, and to 
establish within the organization a long-term LC research agenda. So um, you have a lot of latitude in terms of what you focus your needs assessment on. Um, you could look at issues pertaining to administration of grants. So how you um, apply for grants, the resources that are available within the organization to support submission of grant or space to implement research. You could think about research readiness. Do you have a full team? Are there partnerships that you need to grow or develop? You could think about workforce. Um, and so it's open uh, what areas of focus you'd like to have for your needs assessment. Um, but you would want something to be fairly broad. Um, and I think it's important for it to be structured um, so that you have a defined process for implementing, for gathering the data, for analyzing the data. Um, so you wanna pay attention to the questions that are included in the needs assessment, who the people are that are participating in it and so forth. Um, it does mention in the NOFO that preliminary or anecdotal data regarding capacity building needs is not required. So you're really just focusing um, on a plan and an approach for assessing needs. Perfect, Renee, thank you. There were some other questions received during the registration. If there, should I, I can go to some of those if. Uh, we have two more. Okay, okay, great. <laughs> they're, they're coming in hot and fast. Okay. Uh, could you expand more on what counts as a relevant community? Would a community of educators interested in teaching ELS to undergraduates qualify as a relevant community? Hmm. So, I think the relevant community, we, you know, we are talking about groups of people from the general public um, and the definition doesn't hone in on anything more than to suggest that these are groups of people that have some affiliation by geography, by interest, by situation, and that they are affected by and have an interest in the topics that you're proposing for LC research. So if such a community is relevant to the research questions that you're being asked, it would be up to you to sort of propose and explain and present an argument for the importance of their inclusion um, on the proposed research teams. Um, are there other members of the LC team that have thoughts on this question? I think it's it's the key is it's it's pretty open and I think we it really depends on the research question that's being asked and what your focus is. I would agree, Renee. I think it um, the relevant communities need to make sense in terms of the research question that's being proposed and within the context of the full application. Um, and so that would be something for a follow-up conversation where we can get a better feel for what each applicant is thinking. Yes. Okay. Um, I see a, a question, Renee, if I could draw your attention within the Q&A to a question from Liz Hall. And Liz, I think we'll do our best to answer this question, but I'm not completely sure what you are meaning. I note that each element requires a separate attachment in the proposal. When aspects of our proposal overlap two or more elements, should we describe them only in one application attachment or in each of the relevant element attachment? I would. Uh, hazard, Renee, that um, Liz might be referring not to separate attachments, but perhaps to separate sections. You, and so, yes. is yeah, that, 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 how would you answer? Yeah. So, okay. If you go to in the NOFO in section four, you'll find a section that's called um, page limitations. And it summarizes that your specific games page is one, I mean, your specific games are one page 
And then each of the five elements has a page limit. But when this is submitted and you're preparing your application, both your specific aims and the work you plan to do under each element is described in the research plan. So we're sort of giving you a page limit for you know, the amount of space you would spend describing the elements, but all of those pages would come together and be submitted as your research plan along with the specific aims. I hope that clarifies. So there aren't separate attachments per se, but your research plan might include headings or subheadings for each of those elements so that you're sure that you've covered everything and the reviewers can follow where you're talking about what. I'm hoping that that answers the question. Dave, I saw you put your camera on. Would you like to add something here? Yeah, Renee, I thought that was a good answer. I think one thing that we see sometimes is people may not need to re-explain the whole thing in different places, but, you know, perhaps for important elements that, you know, are relevant in more than one section to try and, you know, weave a little thread through and, and rem remind us of, you know, of, of those points that are, you know, explained more, in more detail somewhere else. Yeah, that's a good point. So maybe cross-referencing what you've said in one element and another element to remind reviewers that you've made mention of it. But you want to be sure, uh, you know, avoid, I would avoid repeating the exact same thing more than once because then that's just sort of taking space. But maybe pointing reviewers to a place that you want to draw their attention to in another part of the application could be helpful. Um, okay, now I have the Q&A box open. Okay, okay. Um, I've been scrolling through, so I, I will keep going, Renee, because it may be challenging for you to know which ones we've done already and which ones I've already typed answers to. Right. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to come back to one question in a moment. Um, I want to follow up on a question um, related to implementation costs. Uh, so the basic question here is whether implementation costs can be included. Um, we noted already in one answer that costs related to IRBs cannot be included. They must, in direct costs, they must be part of the facilities and administration costs. But could other kinds of implementation costs um, be included? Other types of implementation costs. I mean, I think in your budget, you want to propose costs that are reasonable and necessary for implementing the activities that you proposed. Um, and there is in the <clears throat> budget justification section of the application, I'm sorry, of the NOFO in section four, uh, there's a subsection for the budget. You will find delineated there some guidance for the budget justification. And for each element, there are some insights into what should be included. So I would encourage you to look at that section uh, of the NOFO uh, for, some set, for some of the things that should be included. I'm, I'm hoping that that sort of addresses the question. I, mean, I think if you have a question about whether a specific cost is allowable, that that would be a great time to reach out to Devin uh, by email and just ask the question about something that might be specific to your project that you have a doubt or a question about. Great, thank you, Renee. We have um, multiple questions related to eligibility and foreign organizations. Um, I, I would just say, and then Renee, I'll invite you to add that the applicant organization, the organization putting in the grant application must be domestic, either uh, US or including US territories. Um, their foreign components are allowed, but 
Again, it's somewhat context specific, so it would be helpful to have details there, but the applicant organization must be domestic. Renee, would you like to add further detail? Yeah, no, that is that is correct. Um, the applicant organization must be, be domestic uh, and must receive less than $30 million in NIH funding per year for the last three fiscal years. Um, foreign components are allowed under this NOFO. So you can include, applicants can include uh, as subawardees or as consultants, individuals or um, organizations that are outside of the United States. Um, so that is allowable. Um, in the on the resources list, I did include um, a link um, to uh, some information about subaward requirements for both domestic and foreign um, partners. You know, Nicole, I noticed um, that question I was answering about the budget in the Q and A. There was a clarification that the question was asking about the capacity building plan in particular. So I, I'll just note that, you know, your capacity building plan will be informed by your needs assessment in terms of its detail. So you're not submitting a capacity building plan with the application, but you are sort of wanting to prepare for the capacity building work that you would do um, you know, 18 months or so into the project. So I think you, as an applicant organization, you might have some initial conversation about what you think the general needs are. You might talk with any proposed partners about what support they might provide. Um, I think keeping your vision and ultimate goal in mind is important too, and sort of thinking in a very broad general sense, what are the steps that might be required for me to get to where I want to go? Or is it consultant hours that we might need? Is it a, a sub award with a particular type of entity that does organizational development? Um, you know, it, it's it's open. Um, so I would say, you know, ha you have time. The applications are coming in in November. You know, do some foreshadowing and sort of think what might we need to get from here to our ultimate goal. And then the details can come later, but you would want to put in the application budget justification, the types of things that you think would be necessary. And um, Deanna or Devin, I don't know if you wanna add anything more about that in terms of developing budgets. I don't know that I have anything that I want to add about developing budgets. There is a question about F and A, which I can answer later, but I don't have anything to add about developing the budget. Okay. I mean, you're live. You could go ahead and you could answer that one now, I think. Okay. Yeah. So um, the question was part of the problem here might be that similar institutions don't yet have a negotiated F and A rate and it could very, be very low. So there might be insufficient F and A to cover all the new compliance office costs they will incur as they start approaching NIH. Um, one of the requirements for receiving funding from NIH, if it's a, any kind of a application outside of one of our small business program grants is that we require F and A to be negotiated. And so that would actually be something that if an award was made, we would require you to negotiate your rate with the cognizant agency and then apply the FNA that you negotiate. So that's something you're going to have to do. Um, what we would do is you can propose a rate and we'll restrict it until we know what that is, or you can accept the 10% de minimis rate that's allowed under um, 2 CFR, but um, there's going to have to be a rate negotiation. So either way, there's gonna be something negotiated to cover those compliance costs. And for those of you that are not familiar with the terminology, f and is, is also known as indirect cost, and it's money that goes to the institution to cover some of the overhead. And most institutions have a negotiated indirect cost rate with the government, but some of you who are listening now might not be at an institution where you're familiar with that. Thank you. Any other unanswered questions in the Q&A? Uh, we have one from Holly Tabor via Megan Haley. Uh, the elements won't be reviewed separately, will they? 
No, so the the element, so the the entire application will be reviewed as a whole. Um, there are review criteria that are specific to each element, but the application won't be broken into pieces and assessed by the panel um, independently. They will look at the entire application in full. I know there's some types of programs where there might be different components. Um, sometimes a component is submitted under a different NOFO, uh, but here everything comes under one NOFO, is compiled into one application and is reviewed uh, by the same panel in full. And Sarah Whelan, would you like to add anything to that um, since you're our review expert on the call today? Um, no, I, I don't. I don't have anything to add. I mean, I think um, we'll we will use the the same reviewers for all of the elements, and the application will be reviewed um, as a whole all at once, as Renee said. So this is not an application where there are separate cores that are reviewed separately. It's not a multi-component application. Um, if, if that's kind of where you were headed with that question, um, this is a different mechanism. It is not structured in that way. So you will have one uh, impact score for the entire, um, entire application. And do make sure to read those review criteria, as Renee said during her presentation. Um, Renee, those are all of the uh, questions I'm seeing in the Q&A. Um, I will keep monitoring that, but would you like to turn to some of the questions that were submitted during the registration process? Yes. Uh, thanks, Nicole. Um, really appreciate your assistance with this. So one of the questions um, we received was about what types of organizations can an applicant collaborate with? So um, as been suggested, applicants can partner with a variety of organizations, groups, or communities, whether they be public, private, domestic, foreign, academic, uh, industry, civic organizations. It's really about uh, choosing partners that add value to what's proposed in the application and would help the applicant organization achieve its long-term goal of becoming a site that is active around LC research. Um, so helping you accelerate your goals, supporting the implementation of activities, um, whether it be a full element or part of an element, <clears throat> um, you can propose different levels or types of involvement. Um, if you are proposing partners or collaborators, you want to be sure to include letters of support. Um, and again, really think about whether this partner is supporting you as the applicant organization in fulfilling your vision and your long-term goal. That's what's key. Um, we had one other question uh, about, it was sort of related, what's an appropriate role for organizations that cannot apply, but would like to support an eligible organization? So I think here, again, this is at the discretion of the applicant uh, and should be a discussion between the applicant and potential collaborators. There are some examples that are provided in the NOFO of things that applicants may want uh, partners to help with. Um, the training activities or workforce development activities, um, maybe around capacity building, you know, what sorts of steps should I take to uh, enhance my infrastructure to make sure I can get grants out and have them managed um, well, uh, those sorts of things. So it's really up to um, the applicant organization and based on uh, on their needs. Um, and then we did have a question, and I think we answered this, about how to budget for capacity building when I'm not sure what I need. Um, and it's a it's a fair question, um, you know. Your budget may not predict perfectly how you'll spend everything five years down the road, but 
you really do need to have a reasonable approximation of what you intend to spend and be thorough enough to convince reviewers that you have a good sense of the overall costs of managing what you're proposing to do. So you wanna identify the costs that are necessary and reasonable. You wanna budget to hold dollars, round amounts. Um, and reviewers are going to be looking at your budget to assess whether the costs you've proposed seem reasonable and they tie to the aims, methods, and approaches you've, you've proposed. Um, so, you know, if you significantly under or over budget, it might suggest that you don't really have a clear vision for, for the project. Um, and the last question um, we got was around, you know, if I'm looking for someone I can partner with, where should I go? Uh, how do I identify good partners um, or people that I could work with? Uh, NHGRI funds the Center for LC Resources and Analysis. Um, this is uh, the acronym CIRA, and, and they created an online resource called LC Hub. Um, and this resource is intended to try to enhance and promote LC research and is a, is a way to connect scholars with each other who are interested in LC research. They do have an LC scholar directory. Uh, and that's a tool that you could use to identify folks who may have similar interests. Uh, I think you could also reach out to them and um, see if they have some suggestions for you. And we can put the link to um, to LC Hub into, into the chat. And actually, Renee, I see that Sheetal has already done the link to LC Hub and to the Scholar Directory. So thank you. Uh, we did receive another question related to f &A that Deanna would like to answer. Uh, the question is, uh, first, didn't the de minimis rates go up to 15%? Second, how do I get information about how to start the process of f and negotiation since my institution doesn't have a negotiated rate? Or does that happen automatically once I submit my proposal? Thanks. Um, so I'll, I'll take the first one, which is the de minimis rate. Um, 2 CFR Part 200 was being revised. Those revisions haven't come through to NIH yet. They're trying to incorporate them because they are massive revisions. Um, when I'm looking at it right now, it still lists the 10% modified total direct cost as a de minimis rate, but that doesn't mean it's not changing. It just hasn't been incorporated yet and um, into NIH's um, policies. So if that happens, it will happen in October when they give us the updated uh, NIH grants policy statement. Um, as far as the question about how to get the process started for FNA rate negotiation, um, it kind of is going to depend on your institution and who the cognizant agency is that the, your institution has a majority of their funding with. Um, we have some um, very well-funded organizations that are receive the majority of their funding from Office of Naval Research. So that's the cognizant agency. If this is your first application, then that would be an HHS negotiation, which we would in, implement after we make it an award. Um, they won't negotiate it beforehand, but they will do it when we make an award and ask them to do so. I hope that answered your question for you. We have just a few minutes left. Um, if you have any last minute questions, uh, please go ahead and type them in. We could probably take one or two more. Uh, I would also just, I think I think the impression you may be getting is that applying to NIH is hard and RFAs are complicated. I would really encourage everyone to reach out to Renee and there is her email and name prior to submission to make sure that you understand what needs to go into your application as well as to talk through some of these more specific situations and uh, the project that you're really thinking of. It's very important um, to make sure that you can put together your strongest possible application. Yes, and we really appreciate um, folks' interest in this program. This is um, a new initiative for the LC Research Program that we're really excited about and um, are very optimistic about what this program will produce. So please do, um, as Nicole mentioned, reach out to us, um, let us know what you're thinking about. <clears throat> and um, you know, we encourage eligible applicants to apply.
All right. So just as a reminder, we will um, post a Q&A list onto the webinar event page in a few days along with the recording. Um, and we will also um, post a resource list uh, with the links that were shared. So I hope everyone has found this helpful and really excited to, to talk with many of you about your ideas. And Nicole, did anything else come in while we were closing things out here? Nope, just some thank yous, which we appreciate. <laughs> Uh, right. And again, feel free to reach out. We know this was uh, pretty dense and you might have other questions. Uh, we are happy to hear from you um, and really look forward to receiving your, uh, your applications and inquiries. And thanks to the entire NHGRI team for all their support during this webinar, everyone from our technical team and logistics team to our program staff and our grant staff. It, it takes a a village to pull these things off. <laughs> so thanks. And I think we're ready to close. Hey, thank you everyone. We appreciate your time.